of CNS Channel 6. Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to Matters of Public Importance right here on Channel 6. I'm yours, Gail Tashir, representing the Parliamentary Opposition and the People's Progressive Party Civic. This program on matters of public importance brings you information and discussions on issues and matters of concern to you, the Guyanese public, every Thursday between 12.30 and 1.30, right here on Channel 6. And as usual, before we get into the meat of the program, let me remind you of the telephone numbers you can use, 225-0010 and 225-0008, and we'll probably be able to take calls around 1110. Please remember, too, that if you're calling, I need to be able to see your numbers on the screen. So if you are calling for a number that's private or blocked, I wouldn't be able to take the call. And as I inform you every week that the Office of the Leader Opposition is open from Monday to Saturday, Monday to Friday, all day, Saturday, half day, and that we're available to meet people if they have issues, they want to make representation, they have concerns, or they just want to come in and say hello. It is telephone number 225-3432, 225-3432. And of course, Freedom Radio continues to broadcast. Our license have been reissued. And so FM 91.1 Demerara, 90.5 Burbies, and 90.7 Esequibo. And as usual, we remind you, the mirror is available online, free of charge. You can join and read the mirror uh, www.facebook.com slash weekend mirror news. Some of you were inquiring, you know, why you didn't have the program last week, why they weren't able to hear the program last week. Well, unfortunately, um, CN6, uh, Channel 6, was undergoing some maintenance work, and therefore the studio time wasn't available. So we were, were sorry about that, but we're back here this week, and we're very happy to be back with you. Well, and what we were going to talk about last week for a little bit, and we'll do it this week again, as we should have, and that is... Uh, Hurricane Dorian, which devastated the Abaco and the Grand Bahamas Islands in the Bahamas. The media reports, the video footage, the photographs during the hurricane and after, particularly some recent ones, have left us saddened and shocked by the loss of life and devastation of the islands and the lives of people on these islands. As you know, Bahamas made, is made up of 700 islands, but only 30 are populated. The total population expected to be affected on Grand Bahama and Abaco, Abaco's Islands is estimated at 76,278. And so far, although they have said 45 persons have been confirmed dead, the majority of them from Abaco, Abaco's Islands, um, they're now saying last night that approximately over 2,000 people are missing that cannot be accounted for. And so it's, it's really sad what is going on there. And as I said, the photographs are just as if, you know, a nuclear bomb went off there. Well, the People's Progressive Party on September the 4th put out a press statement <coughs> extending its sympathy for all Guyanese and the PPP and our wholehearted support to the government and people of the Commonwealth of Bahamas in their time of need following the devastation caused by Hurricane Dorian. Guyanese are horrified by the unspeakable destruction of life and property on the Abaco and the Grand Bahamas Islands. At the same time, we salute the bravery and resilience and selfishness of so many Bahamians to rescue people in their communities under t dangerous conditions. Prime Minister Minis has called this a tragedy of epic proportions and has recognized that the reconstruction of these islands will take years. We recognize that Bahamas will require consistent regional and global support for a long time to come. Guyana must extend its support to Bahamas as quickly as possible, as it has unflinchingly done in the past for fellow brothers and sisters in the Caribbean who suffered terrible natural disasters." End quote. So that was September the 4th. <coughs> you know, Guyana has always been, been ready to assist our Caribbean brothers and sisters, Haiti after uh, hurricanes and earthquake. Grenada after Hurricane Montserrat after the volcano erupted. On more than one occasion, we sent the GDF Engineering Corps to help rebuild infrastructure both in Haiti and Grenada, remaining there for months, uh, financed by the Guyanese government. 
So we call on the government, and that's what we were saying on September 4th, to act with alacrity. Um, well, it's September 12th, and really, Gan has not coughed up. What we do know, what we are willing to suggest, is that Ghana can assist now with resources we have at our disposal. Rice, building materials, sand and wood, and sending our GDF Engineering Corps to help clear, restore, and reconstruct damaged infrastructure. However, as usual, the government will lose precious time dilly-dallying as it seems bent on mobilizing private sector support first. But may I remind you, or maybe you don't know, that Trinidad and Barbados and Jamaica have already committed and are actively involved in assisting the Bahamian people. We have heard that there are Guyanese who have been stranded and really need our help. Many want to come home. Reports say that many are not yet accounted for, that is, the Guyanese that are not yet accounted for. I can't understand why the government is taking so long to get its act together and help the Bahamians and our own nationals there. You know what it's like to be on an island where everything's been decimated and, you know, you, ha you have lost everything. We have to let our heart and support has to go out to the Bahamian people. But we have a special place in our heart for Guyanese who are stranded there. And so the Guyana government needs to get moving. It is now September 12th, a week later. And so why aren't we, as Guyanese, Caribbean brothers and sisters, you know, responding with greater speed to the, the disaster that has happened there. <coughs> well, please remember September 1st, as you know, is Amerindian Heritage Month. Uh, that signals the beginning of Amerindian Heritage Month. And since 1995, the late President, Dr. Chedi Jagan, following representation by the Amerindian communities and organizations, designated September as Amerindian Heritage Month and singled out September 10th as Amerindian Heritage Day. September 10th was chosen for special recognition and honor of the achievement of Mr. Stephen Joseph Campbell, an Amerindian born in the village of Maruka, who on September the 10th, 1957, entered the Legislative Council of British Guyana as the first Amerindian to be elected to the legislature. And he was not a member of the People's Progressive Party, by the way, but that he was a member of the United Force and he was um, elected. And so here was Chedi Jagan designated the 10th of September every year from then forth from 1995 as a day to honor Stephen Campbell. As usual this year, Amerindian Heritage Month celebrations were kicked off in the presence of the president, or as I say, the caretaker president. What was most interesting from the photographs published in the media was the presence of an unusual flag on display. It was not the Guyana flag. It turns out from various sources that this is the caretaker President Granger's standard. Now let me explain. Each president has a standard. That is a flag um, that, that is designed, that represents their issues, their concerns, what their policies might be and stuff like that. One had been created for Chedi. Um, after he died, actually, it was finalized after he died, uh, and and Janet's own uh, was finalized after she had left office. Um, to date, uh, Ramatar and Jack Dale do not have a standard of their own or any at this point, but Mr. Granger has one, and you saw it, the green with the way the uh, middle part. I've seen it up close, but I won't try to explain because I might get it wrong. But the question I want to ask is why was the Guyana flag not in full display? And why would the caretaker president standard his flag be on display at Amerindian Heritage Month celebrations? Odd, one might say. These trappings that the caretaker president seems to admire are reminiscent for those of my generation born and struggled under the Burnham years and the Burnham era we remember the issue of flags, PNC flags on government buildings, you know, that were flying in the, in the police headquarters, the army headquarters, and the judiciary, there were PNC flags, not just the Guyana flag, not the flags of the discipline services. And so this is harks back to those memories. And of course, even more recently, 
under this government, the, the painting of government buildings in what I call the Apnu Iguana Green, um, in other words, branding our country, the branding of our country with the a APNU AFC colors. But he forgets that the nation is not Apnu AFC. His party can put up the colors wherever they want, but not on state property. And here, so now we have the president's standard at national events. Do we need to be reminded that he still thinks he is the president of our nation, flying his standard like some emperor, ignoring the fact that he is a caretaker president, one that is denying our right to vote at elections since the no-confidence motion on December 21st, 2018? You see, remember, I've talked about before in this program over the years, you know, that this government, in particular this president, appears to like the trappings of small things and somehow loses focus on the real big issues that confront our nation. So the small things, painting, having a standard, and taking to Amarindian Heritage Month, I just can't comprehend that. What I do remember that the standard is put behind the president's chair and cabinet to remind us that he's the president. But certainly you don't need to remind it who is the president of the Amarindian Heritage Month. Or should I say he wanted to remind everybody because he is the caretaker and president. Well, what was interesting, however, at the official launching <coughs> was the National Tushar Council representative and, and also a representative of the APA, Mario Hastings. And let me pause to say that Mario Hastings is a relative of Minister Dawn Hastings, also from the same village of Kako, Upper Mass. So what did Mario Hastings have to say at the official launch of the Amarini Heritage Month, the Sophia Exhibition Complex? Here's what he said, and I'm quoting directly from what the newspaper said, so if the newspaper got it wrong, I would have it wrong. We are uncertain of our political landscape and call for the elections to be held soonest so that we can return to normalcy, he stated. Shall I repeat it? We are uncertain of our political landscape and call for elections to be held soonest so we can return to normalcy. These are the words of Maria Hastings. That one statement alone shows that the NTC, the National Tushar's Council, has added its voice to the call for elections soonest. This statement must have caused quite a stir at at that activity because there were all these government officials at the launching, especially in the presence of the caretaker president. Hastings also pointed to problems faced by many communities in the areas of land demarcation and titling. He said the situation has worsened because, quote, some of our lands are not yet, re yet recognized and exist without land titles and official demarcation, and our claims for land extensions moved, move at an exceptionally slow pace, he said. He went on to say, we need our land, our land is our life. Sidney Alicock, being the apologist that he is, tried unsuccessfully to defend the government's inaction for the last five years in not granting any land title, no one extension for any Amerindian community in Guyana, and also being unable to account for the US $10 million left by the PPP government to complete the Amerindian land titling program of this country. Instead, what does Mr. Alicock say? <coughs> land rights is multifaceted, and while it's important that our policy makers understand the value of space for all to live, it is important that indigenous peoples understand that all Guyanese have a right to share in the distribution of our resources. We need to find a middle ground where we embrace this reality. So this is, again, what Mr. Alicock went on to say. He went on to point out that many villages have been applying for land extension with no clear vision outlined as, how to, as to how the land will be used. And he said, what do you want with the land to those gathered at the launching of the Amrini Heritage Month? Alicock went on to say that the villages applying for land had to now, please note now, also have a village improvement plan, what's called a VIP. It should be noted that this requirement of a village improvement plan is not written into, nor is it included in the Amrindian Act. So in other words, the government is putting a new obstacle, another obstacle, 
being put in the way of those communities applying for or those waiting for titles and extensions since 2015. We must also remember that as soon as the APNU FC came into office, they dismantled the Amarind Indian Land Titling Unit and team that had been working through the Low Carbon Development Strategy funds earned by Ghana through carbon trading with Norway and with UND support, with UNDP support to demarcate and give titles to our Indian lands, to all our Indian lands. Four years later and pending elections, the caretaker APNU FC government only now seems to recognize the critical role and vote of the Anurin people. It is also it also remembered terminated 1,972 community service officers in July 2015. Possibly in response to the statement by the NTC on September 1st, having issued, as I said, no Amer Indian land titles nor extensions since coming to office on, on, in May 2015, the Department of Public Information announced on September 6th that the Cabinet had, has given the green light for absolute grants of land titles for eight indigenous communities, end quote. Well, the first question, is in this a decision of a president and cabinet that has stood resigned since December 21st, according to Article 1066 and 1067 of our Constitution, and upheld by the Caribbean Court of Justice on June the 18th and July the 12th, 2019. Therefore, under what authority will the president sign such absolute grants and titles when the Caribbean Court of Justice explicitly ruled in its consequential orders of July 12th that the government would be a caretaker government with restricted legal authority. The same release goes on to refer to the establishment of legal boundaries and name four communities, Parabara, Rockstone, Tasserine, and Kangaruma. Interesting choice of words establishment of legal boundaries. Does this mean that the illegal cabinet is commencing the demarcation of these communities and therefore the DPI is misinforming and misleading the public and those Amarinu communities that absolute grants of land titles are being issued? Because once you start the demarcation process, then you will have to wait before, until that's completed before the grant, the, the title is given. Over the last four years, the PBPC has repeatedly raised the issue of titles and extensions being granted in the National Assembly. We have raised the matters in the Parliamentary Sectoral Committee on Natural Resources and in many other forms to no avail. The National Two Shards Council also has repeatedly raised this issue to no avail over the same period. Individual communities have also raised their outstanding application for extensions and titles with various government officials, including the President, to no avail. The government has ignored all these requests and representations. <coughs> Therefore, one must come to a conclusion that without, if there were no, no confidence vote, and without the no confidence vote, it is very clear after eight years, eight months delay, that this caretaker government would not have moved an inch to issue any absolute grants. However, now that they are feeling the, the pressure to call elections, both locally and foreign, that they are now deciding this to make this overture to the Armenian communities. The last minute ditch, ditch effort to win votes in Armenian communities during Armenian Heritage Month is just another election gimmick. And didn't the people of Ghana go through enough of that in 2015? All the promises, and we'll come back to those. One must remember that the PPC government left, as I said, 10 million in the Armenian land titling project. And how is that money used? And where was it used? And remember, this is the same ministry that the Auditor General in his report of 2017 was questioning where I think it was about five to six hundred million dollars where it did, were unaccounted for without proper documentation. So this is clearly another new election gimmick, and like another, and it's like another recent announcement of the removal of the 14% VAT for hinterland passengers traveling to interior locations. 
Following this announcement, the GRA issued a list of 54 airstrips where the VAT would not apply. However, with the exception of Cameron, few flights, if any, ever go to the other 53 airstrips, maybe only a charter here and there. For example, no planes have gone to the listed airstrips, airstrips in Region 9, with the exception of RAMS, which is a, 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 a medical service that's been there from the 1990s. This is another election ruse by a caretaker government, and we should expect and witness many more to come. The Guyanese people remember the plethora of promises of decriminalizing marijuana and amending the sentences for being in possession of small quantities of marijuana, including removing jail sentences. We remember the promise of 20% salary increases for public servants and teachers, just to name a few. All are broken promises. And so we know that in this Amrini Heritage Month, there is an attempt by the government to regain ground, and they are not going to succeed. There are ministers flying around, opening schools that were ready since 2015, um, that are now getting wood ants. They weren't painted. They did nothing to them. And so they're trying to recoup. Well, you know, on September the 10th, Amrini Heritage Day, which I spoke about earlier. The caretaker president is large entourage, accompanied by what I call the Green Chairleading Brigade, descended on the Riverview Community Region 10. From the photographs I have seen, the crowd was small. Maybe people are tired of listening to empty promises of the caretaker president and his cabal. But at the launching on September 1st, I have to go back to that. The president pointed out and focused on education. Plans are, he says, are on stream to continue improving hinterland education over the next 10 years in what, and I'm quoting him, what I have dubbed the decade of development from 2020 to 2029. In this manner, the president sidestepped the key issues of concern to our many communities. Of course, number one, land titling. Two, reduction of poverty, jobs and job creation access to education and health services, deteriorating infrastructure, cost of living, taxation on every item. Shame that this is, and he talks very philosophically about education, who wouldn't like to do that? But people have main concerns, and he did not address one of those. And these demands that I'm reaching out, reading out to you, what are the, the concerns of the Amrini communities and hinterland communities, these are so similar, almost the same, for every other community across Guyana, regardless of ethnicity or class or geographic location. The caretaker president pontificated. Again, I quote him, hinterland, educa hinterland education is being repositioned to help to eliminate inequalities and to ensure that every child goes to school and no child is left behind, end quote. You know, he went on to talk about the trend of increasing budgetary allocations for education um, and will also continue to keep hinterland education on the right path. The future is bright, he said. We shall continue the, to the, the task of improving hinterland education. One, when, one wonders, where does the caretaker president live? Yes, the budget has increased sizably, but where's the money going? It's like the health budget. Four or five billion dollars for health, for medical supplies and drugs being spent. It's not that it's put in a bank and locked off. The money is being spent without tendering many times, without proper procurement procedures. And yet where are the drugs? Where are the medical supplies? So the president again is living in La La Land. His government, as I said earlier, terminated 1,972 young Amerindian community service officers in August 2015, and in doing so, removed $700 million from the economies of the Amerindian communities over these years. This single act alone increased the poverty levels immediately in the first few months of the APNU AFC government. Large numbers of school children across interior communities did not receive the materials for their school uniform allowances for September 2018 to July 2019 school year, nor for this new school year of September 2019 to July 2020. 
Granger removed the cash care program for all school children in public schools across Guyana, and thereby, by doing that, denied $8 billion the children from benefiting, children of Guyana in school, from benefiting from $8 billion over the last five, four years. But what has he replaced it with? Nothing. Where did that $8 billion get used for, for the benefit of the children of Guyana? Nowhere. And the same fate is similar to the school feeding program in many of the interior areas. These were specifically designed to have a backward and forward integration between the farmers of those communities and the schools and be able to create the diet that was healthy but was also culturally one that would be easier for the children to manage. And so all that's gone. All that's gone. Why are there so many shortages in the interior? This is what Mr. Granger must tackle. In 2018, the, the total vacancies for teachers in the public education sector <coughs> for the whole country was 3,000, of which there were many, many vacancies for many, many trained teachers and specialized teachers in interior locations. What do you talks about that? How do you improve access, equal access to education when there are teachers in the schools? And so, why is it everywhere you go in the interior there are vacancies for teachers? There are unemployed teachers in the villages, you know. On Sunday, I was in a particular community for the Amrini Heritage celebration. And there were two teachers in there ready to work, but could not get work in the regional education department to work in schools in their region, which would be more convenient to them and which were were not far from where they presently live, so it would not be a great difficulty and cost to them. Of course, they've been trying to get a job for several months now and have not succeeded. Yet I went to some of the schools in that region, in Region 7, where the villagers said, we're short two teachers, we're short three teachers, we don't have enough teachers here. So you have this whole mismatch of what are the needs and what are the skills available, and all the caretaker president can talk about is, you know, the decade of development, 2020 to 2029. Well, how about using some of the money we have now to resolve these issues? But anyway, it's too late. The elections are around the corner. And so <coughs> we have in every school in the interior shortages of stationery, exercise books, textbooks, and other materials for the classrooms. And this is at the primary level. I haven't touched the secondary level. In one village, the teachers were forced to cut the exercise books in half so all the children would have something to do their work in. It's a shame. These are poor interior communities. They don't have big shops nearby, and they can run in and buy some exercise books if they run out. By the way, this particular case I'm, I'm, I'm referring to where the books were cut in half by the school in order to make sure every child had kind of a book, exercise book, was the same village on July 6th that the caretaker, first lady, and ministers with the regional officials landed to open the school in that village. I'm talking about Parima, Region 7. This was a school built seven years ago, several years ago, and was beginning to show wear and tear. The community had been writing for years now to ask the ministers to come in and open it. They kept canceling all the time, and then suddenly they realized they better go in and do it. Of course, Wood Ants have begun to enjoy the building as much as the children. And they've opened another one. They also opened another one on the same day in Cameron, which has no electricity whatsoever, nor is it wired for electricity. So we have these contradictions, and therefore the, the, a lot of what is being said is just gaff, gimmick. You know, it is just meant to fool people once again. We have access to drugs and medical supplies right across Guyana, including the public hospital Guyana, and worse yet, in the far interior communities. This is a, the, there's a worsening of the health status of our Armenian peoples as, across, uh, as well as all our peoples. Vaccination of children is at an all-time low in the interior, lower than 30 years ago. When I took over in 1992, October, as Minister of Health, Guyana on record had a reasonably good vaccination period in comparison to the rest of Latin America, South America, and even some of our Caribbean brothers and sisters. We were around 70%. Under the PP government, it went up to over 90% vaccination levels for all children under the age of five. 
We are down now. The, the schedule is down now in a number of interior regions to only 34% of the children have been covered in, vac in their vaccination schedule, as they should be. And this is unbelievable. This is a, a, a good story of Guyana that has been there for years. It Conum area, the Hoyt area, the Jagan area, right through the 2015. And now you have this government that can't even keep a thing that Burnham was able to keep going all these years, even when there were things rough. And so it is unbelievable. There is no excuse for this. There is no excuse in this country for why our vaccination schedule has declined like this. In the last budget, this issue was raised on the floor of the House of why the stats were dropping to set back to 70 odd percent vaccination levels, which were comparing to pre-92. Of course, the Minister of Public Health was unable to properly answer. But one thing is clear, without our children being properly and, and vac vaccinated and vaccinated in a timely manner, that is according to schedule, the risk for return of preventable diseases increases in our country. And as I said, yet billions are being spent on, in the health sector. Drugs, we can't see them. Where are the vaccines? Where are the medical supplies? Where are the, the efforts to fix a lot of the machines in various hospitals that aren't working in this country? <coughs> the Minister of Public Health herself says that there are 13 specialist doctors in Bardock Hospital. But when the machines are not working, when the x-ray is not working, the ultrasound is not working, they came to Parliament for over $2 million, almost $3 million, to install a CT scan. It was not a new CT scan. It's a very old CT scan that was donated to them. We warned them it would not work. They spent the money as usual, like they did in Burpees, for the same old CT scan that up to now is not working. And so, of course, it's not working. So your machine's not working. You don't have drugs, basic drugs and medical supplies. So how are these doctors to perform? They're not, you know, they're not, as they say, witch doctors. They are bush doctors. They are specialized doctors that have been trained by Ghana. Some of them are foreign. And they're sitting there unable. So basic, basic cases are being sent to Georgetown that Bartik Hospital, for example, or Letham Hospital could adequately manage. In Bartika, there's a rush to spend 74 million on roads not in the center of town where you have big craters that go through, but the connecting roads for places like two miles and 72 miles. But where did this money suddenly emerge from? It's not in the 2019 budget. So where did this money suddenly emerge from? I don't want to begrudge the people living along those roads who've suffered terribly with really bad roads to not have the pleasure of, of having a, 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 a easier road to pass through. But why all these years this wasn't done? And what to me is clear is that what the government should have been doing in the last four years, they are now rushing to spend and do in a few months while they wait to demit office. That's the only conclusion. They're on their way out the door. But they still believe they must be desperate and spend the money and to be able to hope that they'll win or they believe by some miracle they'll win. Only the PEP, CN government can begin to reverse these trends and provide jobs, better health and education, infrastructure and land titles, and, and incentivize, stimulate the economy so that all of us can benefit. The Armenian communities, like the rest of us, are not fooled by the handouts of green and yellow satchels in this election season. Can you imagine that they went and collected a whole set of donations from some businessmen of satchels that are probably worth about $800, and had them in, uh, machine stitched with David G on it. So the children are being branded now. We have the buildings being branded. We have State House being branded. We have the <coughs> Ministry of the Presidency branded. We have the Sports Hall being branded. And now, of course, we have the children being branded with green and yellow satchels. And that's fine. One could say those are just colors. But then you put on a David G. And these are not, this is donations given by companies. Of course, it seems to be a trend of the government. They get a donation, they go to a businessman, ask for a donation, and then they stand there like lords to hand over a boat that they didn't come from the government, didn't come from their party, came from some businessman in the back who's trying to protect himself from getting into trouble. 
And so we've seen that recently in one of the islands in the Esquivel. A boat was handed over to a community for the school children to get to school. It was donated by businessmen from an entirely different region. And Minister Harmon had the gall to hand it over as if it was his, his um, kindness that this happened. He didn't put one cent of it into it from his big salary. This came from a business that's donating the same thing with the satchels. They've ordered thousands from various businessmen who have obviously followed the pattern. Anyway, let's continue tracking. <coughs> As we do every week, today is 265 days since the passage of the no confidence motion on December 21st. 265 days, eight months and three weeks. Today is 173 days since March 21st, or five months and three weeks when elections were due. And of course, you know the president continues to not name a date since December 21st. And you know, I've said on this program, it is no other than the president who is denying the Guyanese electorate the protected right to elect their representatives since March the 21st. It is not just the PUP who is exposing this tra tra travesty. When we read various media houses, even those that were hostile to the PUP in the past, they are now exposing the issues. And, and I'll just give one example. Uh, there are several. Uh, Starbuck News, which I saw today, is now being accused of being PPP. I never knew Starbuck News was PPP. I never knew that uh, that was a so. But Starbuck News is a criticize us in government and criticize us out of government. So up new, we've got to grow up. If you want to be in politics, you've got to take the licks. You can't always be giving it all the time, as you did to the PPP when we were in government. The whole sorry saga, this is what uh, uh, Starbuck News says in August. The whole sorry saga since December 21st revolves around President Granger's self-propelled determination to postpone elections, possibly until their due date, had not the no conference both supervened, and perhaps even in order to favor a framework or implement policies that which might make it easier for the government to win another general elections. Despite the CCJ ruling, he has not brought himself or his government into compliance with constitutional requirements, and the cabinet, for example, has not resigned. <coughs> he is proceeding as if the whole political and governmental situation is normal, and at the heart of his procrastination tactic lies Qigong. Did you hear me? Let me repeat. And at the heart of his procrastination tactics lies Qigong, the Ghana Elections Commission. When one goes to the, the Latimer Handbook of Parliamentary Democracy, and, it, uh, and this is a, like the, the handbook for the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, here's what it says. If the legislature expresses no confidence in the government, the government is obliged to offer its resignation. These benchmarks that they have in Latimer are very close to Article 106 and 1067 in our Constitution. And as you know, what is happening in GCOM? There were two meetings last week, and there's one uh, Tuesday gone with the leading opposition, and there's supposed to be one that started at 9.30 this morning. So what is happening or not happening in GCOM? After another round of meetings, uh, both on Tuesday and Friday, the opposition nominated commissioners of the GCOM, stated that time was wasted with no decision made on the way forward. According to Gunraj, as says Gunraj, Commissioner Gunraj, the production of identification cards was placed on the agenda. However, he said these proposals could delay elections by months. The smallest time frame, he went on to say, is provided by sec sec Secretariat is 92 days, and it goes all the way to 140 days. This is for the production and of the national ID cards. According to Gunraja, time frame of, for claims and objections was not even discussed. This is despite Claudette Singh ordering that extended claims and objection be held after the House House exercise ended on August the 31st. Commissioner Ropes and Ben said, there are no updates. There is no appetite in my view at GCOM for the holding of elections. Every ruse, every resort, every stratagem is being employed to further delay elections. And so the next meeting, as I said, is, was uh, supposed to be uh, today at 9.30. We have a situation <coughs> where 
the deputy chief elections officer, who you know, Roxanne Myers, who was given the job based on the voter partisan over the person who was given first preference by the panel, which included both members of government and opposition appointees. So we have to ask, under whose authority did the DCEO, Roxanne Myers, travel to Jamaica to examine agencies to make Guyana's new national ID cards when no decision was made by the commission to have new national ID cards? Under, under whose authority did she travel to Jamaica to discuss cross-matching fingerprints with different companies when a reputable international company has been doing this for GCOM since 2008 without complaint? As you all know, the last uh, two, three days of the House House registration, people were intimidated. They were told that if they didn't register, they'd be charged and locked up or they wouldn't be able to obtain a new national ID card. On Tuesday, this week, yesterday, sorry, not yesterday, Tuesday, the leader opposition, Barry Jagdeo, led a de delegation to meet the chair and commission. A letter had been sent by the PPP requesting a meeting weeks before, and this was an appointment date given by the chair. As soon as the meeting was finished with Mr. Jagdeo, and while the commission continued to meet, the secretary had released a statement which was not authorized by the chair and the, and the commission. The GCOM statement that came out around 4 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon stressed that the shift in the time to 55 days between nomination day and election day was justifiable. The PRO stated that ballots will be printed overseas and the service provider had provided a 21 days duration for the printing only. Shipping is likely to be another five to ten days, etc. In response, the PVP appointed commissioner Sace Gunraj stated that he was unsure under whose instruction the PRO was authorized to release that statement, especially as no decisions were made at the nearly four hour long meeting yesterday on Tuesday. The People's Progressive Party responded to the statement that was issued on September 10th and stated that it constitutes a manifestation of the lengths to which the Secretariat will go to justify delaying general and regional elections, which ought to have been held since March the 21st. The statement went on to say, the runaway Secretariat continues to invent reasons for lengthy timelines, including plan for elections in March 2020. Further, the statement from the GCOM Secretariat comes as a surprise. Given that minutes before its release, the People's Progressive Party General Secretary and Opposition Leader, Bar Jagdeo, along with team, concluded a meeting with the Commission where positive signals were sent on the timeline for elections. It is as though elements of the Secretariat were not pleased with this outcome. Notably, the statement was also issued before the conclusion of the meeting involving the GCOM chairperson and the six commissioners. This is the fourth statement issued by, GCOM, by the GCOM Secretary that has either included errors or has touted positions akin to those held by the People's National Congress led caretaker APNU AFC coalition government. The PEP is of the view that the rogue GCOM Secretary cannot be allowed to undermine the progress that would allow for constitutional compliance and adherence to the rulings and orders of the Caribbean Court of Justice. I hope, Madam Chair, Justice Singh, is observing this contemptuous behavior of GCOM staff, contemptuous of the court's decisions and contemptuous of her as chairman and the constitution in undermining the commission's role. The chair knows better than most of the GCOM, than most, that GCOM is bound by the constitution and has to make all decisions in compliance with the constitution. She needs to control the election commission staff who are running amok this is a rogue secretariat. At the meeting with GCOM, Jagdeo stressed to Ch Chairperson Justice Singh that President Granger had been using GCOM as the excuse for not holding elections, and therefore it is the Commission's responsibility to comply with the Constitution. That in fact it was now GCOM that was holding up elections in violation of the Constitution and the CCJ rulings. In the meeting, <coughs> The opposition raised all of the grievances recently expressed by the PVP about the preparatory process for general regional elections. Mr. Jaglio also made it clear that a March elections date was totally out of the question, March meaning 2020. 
We believe elections can be held long before the end of the year, so we made a case for that, Jack Neutro reporters. The PP reaffirmed its position that the simplest, fastest, and cheapest route to elections consistent with the electoral laws and constitution is for the extraction of the names from the national registration of registrants of those who are 18 or who will be 18 and about to create and move and, and move to create the pre preliminary voters list so as to allow the claims and objection period to start. There is no need for the unverified names from the House to House to be merged with the National Register of Registrants, which will contaminate it and take a long time, and there is no need for a new National ID card. Robson Ben, PVP appointed commissioner, maintained that it will take a long time to merge the information and will contaminate the NRR since a large number of persons registered during the exercise will appear as duplicates, and each will have to be investigated in keeping with the previous practice of the Commission. Following the meeting, Joe Hamilton, Member of Parliament and a member of the PP delegation to the GCOM, informed the public later that afternoon that the GCOM chairperson, retired Claudette Singh, had committed to, quote-unquote, working towards a timeline of having elections long before the end of the year, end quote. Despite these encouraging words that we all experienced, I was in the meeting too, that we came up feeling upbeat based on our last words as we closed the meetings, that despite these encouraging words, PNC-led coalition government nominated GCOM Commissioner Vincent Alexander. On the next day, September 11th, is reported in the Guyana Chronicle as saying there's no space for the polls this year. And this led to a response by Bishop Edgill, also a member of parliament, um, with regard to this article in the Chronicle, which said there was no space for polls this year. In other words, you can't have elections in 2019. And so, <coughs> Mr. Bishop Edgell went on to remind in his letter, which I believe may have been published today, I wish to remind that since January 2019, a work program was proposed by the opposition nominated GCOM commissioners to the commission, which would have seen election, act ele election activities being run concurrently and concluded within 60 days. I wish to also remind that the 2015 general region elections were completed within 91, 71 days of parliament being dissolved on February the 28th, 2015. There is now only one question that must be answered, Mr. Edgell says, Bishop Edgell says. Does the PNC-led coalition government nominated commissioners apart from protecting a political interest, have some pecuniary interest in making sure the elections are not held for another year. Is this the reason they're actively pushing for constitutionally mandated elections to be delayed further? We have talked quite a bit on this program and, and certainly in the press about the 370,000 persons who were, um, who were claimed to have been registered in the House House registration, which ended on April 31st. From our calculations, for those persons who are brand new, those who are new that are 14 and above, who were not registered and were captured in the House House registration, and or those who are 18 and above who were not, that in fact, for a voters list, our calculations are that the list should be no more than three to 4,000 new claimants, new registrants, who would have to be entered into the National Register of Registrants. And this can be done in a completely different way, as we've said, by going to claims and objection and letting those 4,000 people who are 18 and above to come back and be registered at a claims and objection. We are very clear that on the dangerousness of moving the house to house with the NRR. As we said, it's fraught with technical, logistical challenges and worse yet time. Time is the most critical component and therefore any delays is allowing Mr. Granger to pretend, the caretaker Granger, to pretend he is Pontius Pilate, 
passing the responsibility to GCOM to tell him when elections will be ready. It is clear that the GCOM's CEO and Secretariat have deliberately for the, for the past eight months refused to prepare for elections, thereby allowing the President to say he cannot have elections until GCOM is ready. GCOM is always supposed to hold elections in accordance with the Constitution. GCOM is always supposed to be ready to be able to have elections within 90 days. GCOM is the body right now which has provided the caretaker president with a cover to not name a date. Totally unacceptable and allowing a dictatorial caretaker president to remain in office. We shall be the first in the world of democratic nations that firstly has had no elections following a no confidence motion and now we shall be the first where the electoral body, GCOM, empowered by the Constitution to hold and manage the electoral machinery and protect the people's right to vote at free and fair elections appears to be in the throes of a constitutional coup d'etat to keep an undemocratic and illegal government and president in office. We continue to urge the chair <coughs> of GCOM to uphold the Constitution, prevent her good name from being associated with presiding over this coup, engineered by elements in the GCOM staff in consort with the PNC APNU AFC-led government and the, P and the PNC so as to keep the caretaker president in office. We've been patient in the PPP for the last eight months and have let all means and options take their course. The legislature, the judiciary up to the apex court, local courts, letters and meetings with the president, the use of plenipotentiaries between the caretaker president and the leading opposition to no avail. What the government could not achieve in the legislature nor in the courts, it is thus far succeeding with GCOM. Remember, I'll repeat that. What the government could not achieve in the legislature, nor in the courts, it is thus far succeeding with GCOM. I had pointed out in earlier programs that GCOM was one of the contributing actors in the subversion of the Guyana Constitution. GCOM now, by its inaction and conflicting signals, is the actor subverting the Constitution. By this indecisiveness, it is allowing a usurper in government to remain against the will of the people. It has no legitimacy to remain in office. We assert our right under the Guyana Constitution to exercise our sovereignty and our power to elect our representatives to govern our nation. With each day that goes by without the GCOM acting in compliance with the Constitution, without the President naming a date for elections. With each day there is no elections, no name, a date name for elections. Our country suffers. Our people suffer. The economy suffers. We are directionless and floating in an open body of water with no rudder and no paddle. We're on the road to dictatorship, and only the people can stop this illegal caretaker government. Constitutional rule is under siege. We're in a constitution crisis. This is a travesty unheard of in any democratic or democratic expiring nation. Our country is in serious trouble. Only the strength and power of the people can stop this madness. No matter what the caretaker government promises at this stage, nothing, nothing, however, can remove the fact that the electorate recognizes and knows that this caretaker government is petrified to face the electorate. Within a few days, my friend, today is September 12th. Within a few days, a week, September the 18th, the caretaker government will be illegal. You have your say. We only have a few minutes left. Thank you. So the lines, are, uh, one or two people have called, and so I wasn't able to stop and to take the call. So if anybody would like to try again. These are very serious times, and you know, the problem with when you have dictatorships and, and dictatorial rule and democratic rule, there's a tendency <coughs> for little Caesars to be created all over the place. And there are an awful lot of little Caesars in Guyana, what you call little princes. Yes, let's take the first call. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Illegal government, caretaker government, and uh, undertake the gov government is a disgrace to this country. You have no, no human, no human, human thing taken in his body to know that people are suffering in this country. Through him, and we still have him, this patient, no good government. I don't care. They need to get out. 
No, let us all go to protest and get them out. Don't wait, thanks. Be ready and waiting for them. These swines. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon, Miss Gail. Hi. Good afternoon. You can feel the pain in the man fight. You hear the man? People get their frustrated. I know. I know. I can. I want to call for the Miss the Commissioner. What's her name again? Uh, I retired Justice Claudette Singh. Madam Justice Singh. Justice Singh, Miss. Yes. Justice uh, Singh. She yeah. needs to make a decision. She can't be going on like this. This thing is clear. She got sense. Everybody know. Everybody in this country that got them can see what's going on in Jacob. So she needs to make a decision. Don't let this thing go on, going on, and making an excuses. And people making an excuses all the time to her. She's a big woman. Can't the newspaper and all the news. I don't know about her, but can't I hear if she's some higher lady? So she, she's not supposed to be, you know, like a month, it's all I know. Seven weeks she's in the job. Yeah. She needs to make a decision, man. Come on. She knows what she got to do. I believe she knows what she got to do, but just to ban, please, people, she can't do it. We well, can't please people. We need to go on. You can see what going on. Listen to my voice. I get the fast rate. There's a lot of people like that. Yeah. We need to get down with the business of this country. This year, drift out. Right now, we're drifting this whole year. Yeah. This year is a waste year for everybody in this country. So we will continue this next year again. Come yeah. on, let's try this thing. Come on, we need to go on. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, these are, you can tell from the program over the weeks and months how the difference in callers and, and what they feel and how they're expressing themselves. You know, six months ago, two months ago, uh, and last week, the week before last and this week, there's a different tone in the, the, the callers. They're frustrated, they're tired and fed up. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon. Hi, good um, afternoon. Mr. Sarah, um, what is going on in our country is really sad. It's sad to know that, um, and I, I was listening to Mr. Govaya, Gary Govaya last night. Uh -huh. It is really sad that um, our country, our country has, he has the, the, the book in front of him and, and he was talking. I mean, for me, even the other people too, it's really sad that they're defying, that they don't, they're not taking, they're not taking the rules seriously. Yeah. This is a demo democracy, de democratic country. Yeah. Right? And we do would have, would have hoped that election would have been within the, the as soon as January comes. Yeah. Um, People, I spoke to people, I was speaking to some people yesterday and they said they are losing hope. But I, we, we, have, we have to keep hope. I'm talking to people who are listening to this program. We have to keep hope. Yeah. We have to keep hope. We have to, we have to fight for, for what we want because a lot of people are struggling. We have two more suicides. Yeah. Two more suicides. And I was really saddened. And, that a, a neighbor, I was taking her to the temple and she sent me some cousin and she said, um, li listen, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried about the rules of our country, the democracy of our country. Yeah. It's not carrying on. We have oil. We, have, we should be moving forward and nothing is happening. And um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, should we do more than this? Do we talk to more people? That I see that the... Um, the cast of people are here, am I right? Um, yes, the, they're in the country now. Yeah, right. But I um, mean, so then, well, well, what should we do? Then? Should we get more people in? Should, should we, I mean, I know Mr. John Bay has been doing everything he can, but we can't let this happen. This is a democracy, democracy. democracy country. Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, this, whatever has been going on, 25 years ago, that's done. We can't have that happening here anymore. Yeah. Elections should be called, and our people are suffering, and, and the people are wondering, and, and there isn't any hope. I, I was talking to a, a, a whole lot of people, and they said, we're frustrated. We don't, we don't, got, we don't got nothing to forget, you know. 
Yeah. So th that, that's how they talk it. Right. Yeah, but I tell them that we have to have hope. Yeah. All of us have to have hope. I speak to Afro Guyanese and they think they're asking me when is the election. You know. But so Yeah, it's so, a question everybody's asking everywhere you go. Yeah, when is the election? When is the election? Why are they hiding? Why I I just thought that the lady that um Mr. Jagway has, has a point. I thought she was a patriotic Guyanese. Yeah. You know, but if they see if you're a patriotic Guyanese. Yeah. The technical